Rangers. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation, and I have with me Mr. Bob Meads, who is the president at IQ Agent. So welcome, Bob. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited to have you, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Doing good. It's, you know, just kind of wrapping everything up and getting ready for a new start. And right. So, right. doing all right. Well, well I'm excited to, 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 work, to talk with you today, and I love these hero conversations because it just gets me to... It gives me an opportunity and our, and our listeners opportunity to get, to get to know the people in the industry so much better. And I love getting started with hearing about your journey to where you're at right now. Oh, good deal. Well, I, I look forward to telling you. All right. So, yeah. So, so get, give me some background. Where'd you get started? Well, that's uh, <laughs> where I got started, I guess, professionally was good old United States Navy. Uh, well, thank I you for your service. Marine. First and foremost, thank, thank you. Chris, yes, I appreciate that. And, you know, um, being a veteran is something I'm very proud of. Uh, I was in submarines uh, for a while. Ooh. Really much enjoyed that. Uh, out of Charleston, I was on the Woodrow Wilson, yeah, which was a boomer. Uh, and then later, I was on uh, I was on an, uh, an AE and did a med cruise. I was in for about seven years, and I was an electronics technician. Uh, I worked on inertial navigation systems, system called SENS. Uh, worked on radars. I did crypto, worked on crypto equipment, uh, you know, and things like that. Uh, ended up getting out in 91. Okay. And I ended up, I actually had a medical discharge. I didn't want to get out. I had a, actually a pretty good career, but I got into something that, that my lungs didn't like. And I, it went from pneumonia to something worse and ended up having to kind of get out. It broke my, I ain't gonna lie to you, it broke my heart. Right. But I really liked electronics uh, and I like troubleshooting electronics. And that, you know, back then, you know, that was the future. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. when I went to the Navy, that's what the recruiter was telling me. Hey, you're going to be in electronics, you know. And so, so when I got out, um, I went to work for NEC Technologies. It's a Japanese company, very good company. And there was a manufacturing plant in McDonough, Georgia. And, you know, so I, I, I signed on there as, a, uh, as an electronics technician. They built computer monitors. Um, and I had never worked on a computer monitor. I worked on a radar screen. It's basically the same principle. Right. And so, uh, you know, I jumped in there, learned, you know, learned about it. And they ended up just making me a, a production engineer um, later and manufacturing lines. So we built computer monitors and then they gave me, which I am still very proud of this today. Um, they had a brand new product that came out and it okay. was a CD-ROM drive. And this was brand new technology and I had to jump in and kind of learn it. Cutting you know, edge, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, you didn't just plug it in. It was, you know, a SCSI drive. And then you had to go into DOS and manually load these drivers and manually hook up the hardware interrupts and your memory address face space and, you know, and, and uh, you know, do all that kind of stuff to get it to work. Right. And so I had to go figure all that out, you know, because at this point I hadn't really used a computer all that much, but I was really getting into it. Yeah. And so I just, I just focused on it and, I, and you know, it, it was a really cool place in my life. And I'm working on this and, um, and they said, okay, you're the manufacturing engineer for this, you know, uh, you know, for this new drive. And, you know, then I had a mechanical engineer and he handled the assembly part of the line. And then I was handling the process part of the line and breaking it up and doing the test. And one of the, you know, first big challenges I had is um, they sent us three discs and they had three, you know, each one had its own test that had to be run in the manufacturing. Right. And so the first one was a table of contents spin up, you know, where you put the CD in and it spins it up and it's got a really big table of contents, you know, and, and that's all that that test did. And then the second disc was like a read, you know, uh, you know, like a read test and it had a bunch of data on it and it would read and it would, you know, test the current stuff. And then the other one, I forgot, it was like some kind of random access test. The problem is this, they wanted something like 700 of these a day. And so I, so, so I'm looking at the manufacturing line and I got my timer and it's like, you hit the button and it waits a second. And then the, the tray comes out, put the disc in, hit the button, tray goes in, spins up, 
shows you the test, operator hits the button, runs the test, get the results, and then hit the button and you bring it out, hit the button, close it. All right, there's not 800 of those time slots, you know, in, right. in the day. Right. And so, you know, so my, you know, and I thought about it and everything, and I actually called Sony because you didn't have burners. You didn't have any CD software back then. So I called Sony and for $1,500, they were able, you know, to condense the data down to one disk. And it was just, I mean, it was this kind of weird thing. And so they handed me the disk and then I had to write a program that would show the menu uh, of the uh, test that had to be taken. And I had never programmed before. And it was written in what's called Tickle, which is tool command language, which is based in C programming. And so I, I dove in and I figured it out, you know, and it took a while. But my solution to this problem was back when they were assembling it, they put the CD in. It assembled with a CD in. So immediately when they plugged it in, it was spinning up as it was going through its power on self-test. So by the time it got to the test station, boom, there's, there's my menu. And they would hit, hit the first one, run, okay, hit the second one, run, hit the third one, run. And then they would hit the button, eject the CD, we're done. We've done all three tests. I was so proud of that. And so that, you know, when I finished that, I got to thinking, this is what I want to do. You know, I, I want to write code that interfaces with hardware. And I just, I geeked out on that stuff. And so uh, that's kind of where I got my, my passion and inspiration for automation. And, and originally I wanted to write drivers, you know. Um, so I stayed there for five years and my wife, um, she became a, a PA and she got a job down in South Georgia in a place called Albany. It looks like it looks like it's spelled Albany. Right. It is, but it's Albany. That's Albany. <laughs> okay. And so I go down there and we went backwards in time about a hundred years. I mean, there's nothing out there, you know. Um, and there was really nowhere for me to get an engineering job, and I didn't have a degree anyway. You know, so there was no manufacturing plants, you know, that, that were close by at that time. And I was just I was depressed, you know, I was trying to find something to do. And my wife said, just, you know, go get your degree. And so I went to a small college down there and got into a bachelor's program, which was computer science and electronics engineering. Oh, cool. And so they took my military credits and I was able to knock out a bachelor's degree in about two and a half years. Oh, great. And, uh, and summa cum laude, 3.84, I'm proud of that too, but it was all C, C++, did some assembly. Java was brand new, so I did a little bit of Java. But I loved programming. And you know, it's funny because my wife would get mad at me because, you know, uh, we had just had my son Taylor and I would come home and they would give us these C programming assignments. And I'm, I'm, I'm all day writing code. Right, I mean, right. And I'm commenting every line and I'm doing this stuff. You know, she's wanting to go out to eat. And I'm like, you know, just one more time, one more time. Yeah. You know? And but, I, but I, I fell in love with it. And just something about the process of doing it, you know, and, and the logics and everything just really, really appealed to me. And so, um, so I got my degree, uh, in 97 and I was looking through some ads, you know, because my, my wife, she did her two years down at, at, uh, at the place in Albany. Uh, and we decided we had to get out of there. So we wanted to come back, you know, toward Atlanta. Um, so when we came back, there was an ad for, a person who was good with an HMI. So I looked up HMI and it meant human machine interface. And I said, Hey, you know, that sounds pretty good. I had no idea what it was, but I knew, you know, it had to do something with programming and, and hardware and people. And so I applied for the job and it was with Siemens. So I got the job uh, and it was working with WinCC, uh, which was their, you know, uh, HMI equivalent. And again, I fell in love. Uh, it, it, it was, this cool software where I could, I could, you know, put a button on a screen and put code on that button and actually go turn a motor on or turn a light on or, you know, do whatever. And so I was supposed to be the technical support, but I ended up doing some development, I ended up going to Germany and working with the development team, uh, you know, working with the bug team and stuff. And I was with Siemens for a while, which is really when I got into automation and got exposed to, 
you know, PLCs as, you know, and, and industrial software in general. And I became an expert on WinCC uh, and Siemens is a, you know, is a great company. Um, and so I did that, you know, for several years uh, up until, I guess, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think it was probably 97, 98. You know, WinCC and Siemens decided they were moving their stuff up to New Jersey, which is a different country with different languages and customs. All right. I couldn't move to New Jersey. I'm in Georgia. You know, it just you can't get there from here. And so uh, I, I I didn't want to, but I had actually made so many contacts and I was kind of known as the WinCC guy, you know, the person. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to start a company. I'm just going to start an integration company uh, and I'm going to do just WinCC work and development work. Yeah. And uh, so I, I talked to my wife and we sat down and we knew it was a big risk. I mean, it, it was scary because I want to take care of my family, you know, and I want to make money and stuff like this. And it was, you know, it was really scary. And so she and I sat down and, you know, you know, she's, you know, she's a PA. She makes pretty, you know, pretty good money. But we had, you know, two kids by that time. And she said, you know, well, you know, you need to bring in at least this amount of money, you know, or it ain't going to work. And I had a purchase order from, you know, one of my contacts at Siemens to write some software. And that would get me by for like four or five months. Okay. And I was also teaching one DC. So I, I teach that software still still teach it today. Right. I've got like a four day course on, on SCADA development. And so I told her, I said, okay, I've got this job. And so, you know, my commitment to her was we're going to try this for a year. And if at the end of the year, if it's not working out, then I'll go find a job, but I got to try this. Yeah. yeah. And so I did that. And at nights I was working on a C language course right. that worked with WinCC because ANCC was the only scripting language for WinCC back then. Uh, so I, I wrote that at night and I worked on this. Uh, it was a, you know, a power system during the day. I knocked out that, you know, that job as fast as I could. And then I started holding classes and I got students in and I found out I was actually pretty good at teaching a class because I understood the software. Um, so I did that and I started picking up other jobs and stuff like that. And at the end of the year, you know, I was able to pay off my wife's college loans. And so, you know, that really worked out, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't making millions of dollars, but I made more than I was, you know, at Siemens. Yeah. And so, you know, that's when my first company, which is called iQuest, which was, you know, born in 1998, October, 1998. Um, and then, you know, so I started doing that, but, you know, really my personal focus is software development and SCADA development and visualization training and stuff like that. You know, I've done PLC work, but I'm not a PLC person. Right, right. And I'm not necessarily a hardware person. And so, you know, by this time, you know, I'm <clears throat> taking full advantage of my Siemens contacts. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I do a good job for them. You know, I actually had for a long time, I had a contract with uh, the office in Princeton and I would come up and I would teach their classes uh, and I would, um, you know, fill in for their hotline. I trained their hotline you know, when they first set the hotline up and things right, like that. Right, right. Did some contract stuff. So it worked out pretty well, but, you know, to really get into automation, you know, you need to do PLC and you need to do controls. And to be quite honest with you, that wasn't really my passion. My passion was really more for software. And so, you know, I met my business partner, Pat Meir, on a job for a, a big tobacco company. Um, and, you know, I went down to Florida and I was teaching, you know, him, WinCC, as well as a couple of people from the company that had given them this big job. And uh, Pat was everything I wasn't. He was also a lot of stuff I was, you know, he, <laughs> probably he's the best automation engineer I've ever met, but he's also one of the, one of the best mechanical engineers out there. Okay. Um, he was a gearhead in high school, you know, uh, you know, took his car apart several times, put it back together. When I met him, you know, for the first time, you know, he picked me up from the airport in this old, old Trans Am that he was leasing and it had a nitrous oxide system. In it. And he had these gates. I said, what the hell is that? It was a nitrous oxide system. I said, didn't you say you were leasing this? So when the lease came up, he had to buy it because he had already modified it so much. 
but uh, you know, he was everything I was, and he could do the PLC stuff. You know, his dad, I think, was a machinist. He worked with him, and so he could cover that end of the spectrum, and yeah. I could cover the software part. And so he and I um, actually met, and we decided, hey, this is what we're going to do, and we immediately wrote. Uh, you know, we had this idea for a product that worked with WinCC and it was an option and it did um, FDA. It helped with FDA validation, 21 CFR Part 11. And basically, you know, it did um, uh, it did audit trails and things like if you made changes, it audited who, what, when, where, why. So that if something went wrong, you could go back and find out, you know, what right, happened. Right. We built that as, as a SCADA add-on. It was picked up by a company and distributed worldwide, gave us some money, you know, there for a while, that was our first successful software product. Um, and Pat, by that time, you know, he had started a machine shop, uh, right. which we still have today and it's tripled in size. Um, you know, that's basically him. Um, but, you know, he's doing the machine shops, doing PLC programming. You know, we've got, a, we've got some, like we've got a, a guy, Brandon, that works for us. It's been with us for a long time and he, he, he does PLCs and he, you know, he writes software and things like that. And so we all kind of made this complete unit um, and just, you know, kind of grew. And, you know, when I was chasing, like I did a lot of WinCC training, like I said, so I'm chasing training, I'm writing software, I'm doing WinCC projects. Um, and we got to, you know, we, we got through 2008, 2009. That was when the downturn hit. For sure. It, it was tough, man. It, it, it just bored us. And, Pat and I were scrambling, you know, we were not a lot of weeks away from not taking a paycheck, you know? And so uh, we were shaking every possible tree that we could and we got through it. And, you know, my good friends at Siemens threw some work our way and Pat was able to find X, Y, and Z. And we finally kind of got through it. Once we did that and things started to turn around in 2010, 2011, Pat showed up with this device and it looked not unlike this, but he showed up and he said, have you seen this? And I said, well, it's an iPad. He said, it's an iPad 2. iPad 1 didn't even have a camera. This is an iPad 2. And, you know, when we started, you know, his basically thing is like, we need to put something on this. We need to come up with something because we know that that's going to hit the plant floor. And yeah. at the time, you had a lot of people in the plants that, you know, uh, had come up with iPhone technology or phone technology. They're comfortable with that. Mobility was becoming a thing. Wireless networks were a lot better. You know, they were becoming a thing. And so um, we started brainstorming, what are we going to do with this tablet that is going to really make a splash on the plant floor? So the first thing was, hey, let's build a SCADA client. You know, and I, I was like, you know, but everybody's going to have a SCADA client. And what does that really do for you? Because they've got HMI panels and, you know, the, the major vendors are probably going to write their own, but are people really going to buy it? And one of the things people are not going to accept right now is having this mobile device and turning your process on and off. And this, this idea that it's not secure, that somebody you know, doesn't have all the controls in place. And, and Right. And plus, it was already going to be out there. And so we, you know, we got into dashboards and we got into SAP interfaces, but everything bugged me. And what bugged me about it was all those were things that you could put on a desktop. And it yeah. wouldn't matter. Okay. And I got to thinking, okay, desktop, mobile device, you know, mobile device works anywhere, works over wireless. <clears throat> and I wanted to create an app that would not work on a desktop because if it's not mobile, then it's not useful. You know, I wanted something that really took full advantage of mobility, the ability to move around, but in, you know, manufacturing, they don't buy glitter and they don't buy gloss. They buy something that solves a problem. Right. You know, they got to have a toothache and you got to be a dentist before they'll spend money. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. so, and this is, Mostly true, but you know, someone asked me back, you know, back in 2013, we're rolling this thing out. How did you come up with the idea? And the product name was IQ Agent. And I said, Well, you know, I was doing what we all do in Georgia on a Saturday morning. I was cleaning my shotgun and I'm watching the Matrix, you know, and, and I'm looking at this iPad trying to figure out what to do with it. 
I may or may not have been watching The Matrix. Right. But right. Um, the idea that we had was this thing's got a camera and I can see the plant through it. And I got to thinking about The Matrix and I thought, what if we had an app that you could point it at like a, a piece of machinery and would pop up relevant information about it so that I didn't have to walk to, you know, uh, HMI panel or go to the PLC. I can just have it. Just, hey, how's this doing? Oh, okay, it's fine. How's this doing? Okay, it's fine. So that's where, you know, so I, you know, Pat and I got together. I said, hey, man, you know, and, and so he starts feeding off me and I'm feeding off him. And we're saying, okay, he's got to do this, you know. And then actually documentation was an afterthought. We were just going to do live process data. Right, right. And we got thinking, well, you know, having the schematics, you know, that there would be handy, you know. Yeah. And, you know, we're in a video and stuff like that. So we hired a developer. I wrote a specification. We actually have a patent on this idea. We use QR codes. And so I branched off from iQuest and started IQ Agent as a company. We bootstrapped the whole thing and we immediately had a customer. We weren't out of beta yet. And we had a, you know, had a big customer and we kind of knew we had something there. And so I kind of went off on this path with IQ Agent and Pat, you know, you know, kept running iQuest and he's growing that. And we just had these two companies that just kind of had this synergy. Yeah. And so, you know, that was, you know, we rolled out IQ agent near the end of 2012. We rolled it out at the MTS show, you know, had, had a couple of global customers, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, won some awards, got a couple of patents. And so I've been developing it since then and moved it to wearables, moved it to augmented reality. There's a new word moved it to augmented reality and things like that Yeah, uh, to get it going. So that's kind of where I'm at today. Um, you know, and, you know, we're still developing the technology. We're still kind of, you know, changing COVID has changed the marketplace yeah. Yeah. for what Pat's doing, what I'm doing. I'm selling to a different customer now, you know, because back in 2018, I'd show up at a plant and do this great demo and they don't listen and blah, blah, blah. Now, you know, they don't want you showing up at a plant, you know, you, you, and you got to have a mask on. And so wearables, we knew that we had to embrace. And COVID has really accelerated people wearing wearables out on the plant floor. Uh, and so we, you know, adopted that. We, you know, we adopted to the first Microsoft HoloLens, you know, uh, real wear, you know, a few other devices that we're really looking at. And that's kind of where I'm at today, um, you know, in, in my automation journey. I am curious on that story. A lot of a lot of entrepreneurs we tell, we talk to, they were always driven to be entrepreneur. They they kind of knew that. With your story, I didn't hear that you were always driven to be entrepreneur. I almost felt like you were thrown into it a little bit, somewhat hesitantly, and then you had this timeline of you know a year that you said I I, I got to make this happen in a year, and then it then it took off or you know. Talk to me. How, have you always had that entrepreneur spirit? Because it seems like you definitely have embraced it once you took once you took that leap. I viewed back, you know, back when I, um, you know, was with NEC and when I was with Siemens, um, I liked the security because you know I came from the United States government. You know, you're gonna get paid, and I liked that. And I had a I had a wife, you know, and and then later had kids, um, and I liked that security. And I was kind of always in awe that somebody that could make their own living just from their own personal self. I was just kind yeah. of in awe. Yeah. Wow. You know, I didn't know that I could do that. But see, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in Alabama. And, you know, when I turned 10, uh, I got what I wanted for my birthday, which was a used lawnmower. And I would cut grass. You know, and I would you know make anywhere from one to three bucks per yard. I cut every grass in our neighborhood within walking distance, and you know then I I washed dishes when I was four. I was driving a car on back roads washing dishes at fourteen. Worked at a horse farm, you know, picked out horse stalls, bailed hay. So I've always had a job, and I've always liked having security. You know, when I was a kid in high school, you know, I always had more money than a lot of people because they didn't work like I did. You know, I right. <laughs> I had to work at it, which is very, very important. It's amazing what happens when you work. You actually have money, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> and so I I was not always driven up to that point in my life to I'm going to go start a business. Right. And I, I'm not going to say a thought didn't occur to me. It just wasn't on my radar. 
But I loved my job with Siemens. Absolutely loved it. I was at home. I love the people that I work with. I love the product I was working on. But I couldn't move to New Jersey. You yeah. know, even if yeah. I wanted to, my wife as a PA, you know, she does anesthesia. That was a state she could not work in. And so it, it was just not an option. Right. And I didn't want to do anything else. And I had people, hey, are you going to, you know, can you still do this job for me? Can you still help me out here? And so I had a chunk of money and a job um, and it was actually back with another, you know, uh, component of Siemens that gave me enough security that I knew that I had at least, you know, six months. Right, um, right. You know, so I had that money. And then by the time I was done with that job, you know, I had also, you know, got my class and I had, so I could see that, hey, I can be one of those people that doesn't have a job, you know, that that's making their own money, they're self-employed. And so it was a gradual process for me to prove to myself that I could do it because I've all, even today, I'm looking at the bottom line, I'm looking at what I got in the bank and I'm always thinking runway, you know, how long can I pay myself? How long can I pay my development team? You know, how long is, you know, make sure Pat's not going to come, you know, knock me in the head with something, you know? Uh, and I'm always looking at that. So stability and, and, you know, things like that are always very paramount to me. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I can't say up to that point I was driven. I, it, it definitely came afterward for me. Any, any advice for the listener out there who maybe has that entrepreneurial uh, drive and is a little hesitant to take that first step? A anything that you'd offer up to would, that would help them, you know, embrace that and lean into it a little bit more? Yeah. And this is actually a very good time to become an entrepreneur because there's now there's this, you know, uh, there's this been this surge of people who freelance. Right. You know, there, right. there's a lot of websites that where you can go and sign up and, you know, Fiverr is one, Upwork is one. There's a few others where you can go up and say, OK, I want a program. Here's a list of programming jobs and you bid on it and, you know, and, and you can go do that. And so that is a way to be self-employed without actually starting a business. And a lot of people are doing it. There's people freelancing and are making six figures. But if you, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to do something, you know, the, the biggest thing is make sure you have a well-documented business plan. You need to sit down and think. It's not like I'm going to build this app and everybody's going to come show up. And trust me, I've seen that movie, you know. You know, go, go watch, you know, Field of Dreams, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. Right. Uh, that's not real life, uh, you know. So have a very solid plan. Know exactly who you're going to sell to. And it's usually not who you think it is, especially if you're in the manufacturing automation market. Now, if you're business to consumer, if you're going to go sell apps, sell games, you know, make trinkets, whatever, you know, then that's a different, you know, that's a different model. But you got to have a solid plan. You know, you've really got to do your homework and you, you need to be able to not pay yourself for a year to 18 months. You've got to be able to make it like that. And you've got to be willing to do that. You got to be willing to not go out and blow a bunch of money Friday, Saturday night at the bar. And, and you got to be willing to live on a shoestring. You got to be willing to just give everything, you know, to that. Right. And you can't do that without passion. Yeah. That's right. Not for long. That's right. So That's the right. The biggest piece of advice is do what you love because as long as it's legal, right? <laughs> as right. long as it's legal so that you can get an actual pay for, paycheck for it, um, you're if you love it and you're passionate about it, you're going to be good at it. Yeah. And as long as you're, you know, living above the poverty line, it's like I, I you know, I was telling my kids, you know, I, it doesn't matter what you do as long as it's legal and you can live indoors. All right. <laughs> so, you know, you may want to live in a mansion, then that means that you're going to have to, you know, go do something that where you make a lot of money. You may be fine living in a really nice trailer on your own little patch of land, or you may be fine living in the suburbs, you know, but whatever is, you know, is going to make you happy in life right. in your living situation you got to pick something that that's congruent with. That's right. You know, if you, Hey, I want to be a Hollywood actor. Okay. Well, you know, 0.03%, you better have a plan B, you know, <laughs> All right. Right. you know, so, you know, so, that's right. you know, so you got to find something that has passion. You got to have realistic expectations. You got to work really, really, really hard 
And the last piece of advice I had, and I saw it the other day on the internet and I immediately was drawn to it, but you are never going to be successful being comfortable. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. Right? You can't. Right. You can be comfortable. All right. After you're successful. Right. But, you, but if you really have this vision, you've got to struggle and you've got to be uncertain. And that was one of my hardest things. And I still struggle with it today. You know, back when I made the decision, I gave myself a timeline. Right. And I said, okay, well, I've got enough money and I can stretch this out for an entire year and we can barely get by. And then I'll make a decision. But I knew that I was going to have to bear down. And I did. I was not comfortable. I was scared to death. I felt like I was stepping off the edge of a cliff because I didn't want to let my wife down. I didn't want to let my kids down. And I didn't want to fail. I don't like failing. <laughs> you know, don't like. So, you know, those are all the things that kind of go into it. But I think the most is have passion. I love it. I love it. That was such great advice, Bob. And we don't talk about the entrepreneur stuff that often, but I'm so glad you that you went there. Now I am curious for let, let's talk about things you like to do for fun. So what, when Bob's not, you know, sitting behind programming and making augmented reality, what are you doing? Any hobbies, anything like that? I am a home brewer. Home brewer. Okay. Beer, and I absolutely love it. I've been doing it for about four years. I've won some awards. Nice. Um, and, you know, I've been tinkering with the system, but it, you know, the thing is, coding and teaching, you know, and brewing beer. And I also, you know, another hobby I have is I like to smoke meats, like, I, you know, briskets and ribs and stuff. And the thing they have in common is they are, they're all a process. Oh yeah. And they're a process where you can constantly improve. And, you know, when I drink, you know, I, I, I like beer. And so, you know, brewing beer is a process and there's a lot of variables and you can do a lot with it and, and you can really research it. And, you know, you, it doesn't take a lot to make good beer, right? It takes a lot to make great beer, you know, and it, it, you don't have to do a lot to make ribs that are edible or ribs that are decent, yeah. you know, but if you really want to make the perfect rib or you want to make perfect beer, then there are these incremental things that you can do. And that's what I really like because what I get out of it, if I give you a beer that I made and you go, Holy man, you know, that, that's, that's great. That's better than Tropical or whatever. That's, that's where I get my satisfaction. Right. I'll drink it and like it, but I like other people to eat my ribs and I like other people to drink my beer and, and tell me, so I get a kick out of giving that out. So <clears throat> those are two of my biggest hobbies is, is brewing beer and, you know, cooking, smoking meats and things. Well, like just, that. just let me know the next time you fire it up and I'll be, be heading down <laughs> to Georgia, buddy. Oh, you know, love to, love to have <laughs> you down, man. Now we love, we love talking about family. You mentioned your wife and your kids. So what, what can you tell us about your family? Well, I have been married since 1986. Okay. Uh, you know, so we're coming up on our 30 year anniversary in a couple of years, you know, so we're what, 36 now. Um, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of ups and downs and, you know, somebody at work asked her the other day, how do you stay married so long? And she immediately said, you can't hate each other at the same time. <laughs> you know? And I thought that was brilliant because it's exactly right. You know, right. because in a marriage you evolve and, you know, we waited like 10 years to have kids, but she is from my, you know, I, I grew up in, in a little town in Alabama and she was also there. I met her there before I went in the Navy uh, and I graduated high school, went directly into the Navy. And then, so it was probably a year and a half or so before we hooked back up and, saw each other and then we started dating. So we didn't date before I went in. Um, and then, you know, so we kind of got together in 85 and a year later we ended up getting married and I uprooted her. She was going to Auburn. Uh, so uprooted her, you know, she was, you know, a, a Navy widow when I was out on the, you know, subs out in Charleston. Right. Right. She stuck with me this whole time. I'm very proud of that. Uh, and we have two kids. Uh, we've got a son, Taylor, who, is 25. He lives out on the West coast. He's a programmer. Um, he's worked in wearables, worked a little bit in augmented reality, you know, he's a good programmer. Uh, and I have a daughter, Lindsay, who is a senior in college in psychology. Nice. Um, we're down in Georgia. All yeah. right. Well, it sounds like you have a wonderful family and, and thank you for sharing that. And, and, and that's good advice for a, for a long marriage, for sure. I'll have to yeah. share that with my <laughs> wife. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Courtesy of my wife. That was, that was her, 
uh, you know, that was hers. And it was very quick, man. I love it. I love it. I asked the guy at our church, you know, recently, you know, they've been married almost 50 years. I said, you know, what's the secret? He was just like, stay out the way, you know, just stay out the way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's about it. You know, so now for, for these hero conversations, Bob, we play a game. It's called a lightning round. I fire you off some quick questions. You fire right back. We'll get through as many as we can. How, you, know, you want to play? Sure, let's do it. All right. So, what's your what's your favorite food? Wow, uh, I think I think ribs are probably yeah. my favorite food, and banana pudding. Oh man, Bob, wow, we have too much in common, my friend. <laughs> All right. All right. How about your uh, adult beverage? I'm curious on your on your your favorite beer. Is it something you brew, or just something else? Yes, I have a I have a beer. Uh, I like IPAs. I like pale ales. Uh, I also like you know some like a, a Munich Dunkel, which is kind of a dark, refreshing beer. But I brew one called a Tropical Ale uh, that I've been refining. I got it as a recipe out of a book, and I've been refining it. It's a lot like Tropicalia. Yeah, uh, if you're familiar with that beer, which is a, a fantastic beer. But uh, but IPAs and uh, occasional I like Scotch a lot. Yeah. Uh, doesn't like me as much as I like it. So I have to kind of moderate that, but I like a good scotch too. All right. All right. Now what's, uh, what's your favorite app on your phone? This is a trick question for you. Probably. Wow. That, you know, <laughs> <laughs> other than IQ agent, That's right. you know, um, you know, I like, um, oh, wow. What's the, what's the one called where if a song's playing, you can hold it up and it'll tell you what song it is. Okay. Uh, what is that? It's, um, yeah, I'll look at, but basically if you don't know what a song is, you can, you can, um, hold it up and it'll recognize song. It'll tell you exactly what the song is. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, and who's saying it and, you know, and stuff like that. So okay. I'd have to look it up, but that's definitely my favorite one. I've got it somewhere. It just kind of slipped my mind. Shazam. Thank you. Yeah. That is a fantastic app. Uh, that, that's probably my favorite. One. Okay. Now what's, uh, what's on your nightstand right now? Wow. <laughs> um, I've got, I've got chapstick because during the, during the winter, man, my lips just kind of stay dry. I keep my car keys there. Got a iPhone charger that you can just lay my phone on. Yep. Uh, and, uh, a, a stack of books about six high that I <laughs> read. What's a, what's a guilty pleasure? Wow. I guess a, uh, my biggest guilty pleasure is, is probably cigars. Okay. I love to have a good cigar. And once a week I meet with some friends of mine that are also entrepreneurs and we've kind of started this thing where we will go and have a cigar usually like on, in, you know, one afternoon a week and just brainstorm and kick around ideas and talk about problems that we're having, you know, in our businesses and uh and that that's really good so. that sounds great so, uh, there's something to be said about a, a strong mastermind group that sounds like that's what you yeah. got that's exactly what it is and yeah. they're they're all smarter than i am so i'm in good company there you go now ha- last one dogs or cats dogs my Absolutely. man yeah. There, only- yeah i've got a dog now um that's a rescue i'm big on rescues yep uh go go rescue a dog and give it a forever home uh, but you know, our first dog, Molly was 14 years old. We lost her in 17, a uh, right. member of the family. It took us a couple of years to get another one. And so we fostered several, right. Uh, and then we found a puppy that's, uh, you know, just kind of a mix, uh, absolutely love dogs. I love it. I love it. Well, you did, you survived the lightning round, my friend. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Now the. Called Eco Ask Why Bob. We always save the why for last. But our listeners know it's coming. So, you know, if somebody wants to know what your personal why is, what is it? You know that that's a that's a really deep question, and you know that you could go really really deep. But you know, I want you know I I think happiness, personal happiness, also comes from making other people happy. And as a veteran, you know, I, I was looking at, you know, I'm on a few veterans groups and a lot of veterans struggle, you know, they struggle, you know, I was never in combat, you know, I was never in a high tense situation. I was in a few, some, you know, but, but I, I never got shot at. I was never, you know, in imminent danger of losing my life or that I knew of, but um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of these veterans that, that reach out and, 
they're, they struggle because they've seen things that, that no person should ever see. And they've gone through things that no person should ever go through. And, you know, and, and I heard some advice a long time ago. And so this guy reached out, you know, on the forum and he said, you know, man, I'm at the end of my rope and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, having all these problems. And I told him the advice that I was given earlier, which was go help somebody because right now you don't feel worthy. You, you, you are hurting. And if you can go help somebody, somebody that could use a, a lunch or somebody that, that could use, you know, a listener or somebody could use a lift to the store, or somebody needs a meal delivery. If you go help somebody, man, that helps you. And so I, I believe happiness comes in, in serving others. And that's why that's really my prime motivator in life is to, you know, provide service and therefore help make myself uh, happier. I love it. I love it. What a great answer. What a great answer. Now for our listeners out there, check out our show notes. You'll find ways to connect with Bob with IQ agent, with all the wonderful things that he's doing. Bob, it's been a pleasure to getting to know you loved your story, just the, the, all the twists and turns and I just wish you nothing but blessing in the future, sir. So thank you well, again. Well, Chris, thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And I, I really appreciate uh, being on the show and you know, it's, it's been, it's been the best hour this week. So I, <laughs> I appreciate you guys very much. Absolutely. Well, you have a wonderful day, sir. Thank you, Chris. You have a great one. What an impactful conversation from Bob Meads. I tell you what, just the many things he's done that, that entrepreneurial advice he gave and then ultimately his why just go help somebody. I think we can all take that and apply that to our lives today. If we just focus on serving others, good things will happen. So check out those show notes to connect with Bob and all the wonderful things that he's building. Now we have the war stories still going and we want to hear them. The good, the bad, the ugly, the stuff you tell at the dinner table, the stuff you tell at the cocktail parties, submit them to us. So go to the show notes, check out the way you can DM those to us directly. And again, if you're like an eco, that's why share it out with somebody, send it in a text message. Maybe you just send an email say, you know what? I heard this episode and it was really cool. This that type of, of, of activity that really helps the podcast. Give us a five-star rating, write a one-sentence review, and it makes all the difference in the world. Have a great day, and remember, keep asking why.